Okay, so um, <coughs> we finished with polar coordinates last time, and uh, on to cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates. Um, cylindrical coordinates is a pretty short conversation, as was the discussion of cylindrical coordinates themselves. It's pretty much polar coordinates. Yeah, and the comma z, right? So there's still height. It's the same z in cylindrical coordinates as it is in rectangular coordinates. So other than that, um, it's pretty much just polar coordinates in the xy plane with the understanding that, yeah, of course, z is still z. So um, you're going to notice strong analogies in how this goes. Um, specifically, if you look for the stretching factor, follow the formula. Now, you've got to follow that three-dimensional formula. Um, but uh, no surprises, you get R. Well, yeah, I mean, it's polar coordinates, <laughs> right? So you kind of expected that. Um, uh, again, if you want to make sure that this is not negative, correction, you want to make sure that this is not negative and thus that you can ignore absolute values, okay, well, just uh, promise that you'll never choose it to be negative and it won't be, <laughs> right? So just like in polar coordinates. Um, likewise, you know, we are doing a change of variables here. We are, we're viewing the, the coordinate system as a change of variables function. We're doing a pullback. We do have a pullback domain. That pullback domain does live over here in our new R theta Z world. But you don't really have to draw it over there because everything you need to know about it comes from looking at slices, right? There, for example, is an R slice. Well, I, I know what R slices look like in cylindrical coordinates. This R slice represents a constant value of R. Okay, well, a constant value of R in XYZ world. This looks something kind of like that. And it's uh, part of a cylinder. Thus the name cylindrical coordinates, by the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, just... Um, See see what you need to know about the range of values of various cylindrical variables by seeing them in XYZ world, by knowing what those slices look like. And don't forget your stretching factor. And uh, go ahead. That's kind of the, <laughs> the punchline of uh, how you do integrals and cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so uh, let's just show you an example. Uh, so here's uh, here's one. Suppose I'm interested in doing an integral on this upper semi-ball of radius A. So, um, by the way, I, I think I've probably said this before, but let me say it again just to be sure. Um, the, the, the word ball is a solid three-dimensional thing. The surface of said ball is a sphere. Right, so mathematicians distinguish between the, the two-dimensional surface and the three-dimensional solid in, in between it, you know, in, inside of it, uh, by the distinction between these two words, ball and sphere. Okay, so heads up about that. Okay, so let's start slicing it up. Um, here's, um, you'll notice I didn't forget my stretching factor. Oh, by the way, you'll further notice I wrote down my stretching factor at the same time that I wrote down the differentials, thinking of this as in fact, a single thing, which in fact it kind of is. It really is the dv from your rectangular coordinates integral that you wrote down in the first place. So it just makes loads of sense. And again, if nothing more than as a memory tool, please write down the stretching factor as you're writing down the differentials so you don't forget. Okay. All right, so uh, that said, uh, let's, uh, starting from the outside, as usual, outside in, theta, what's the range of values of theta? Well, here's what a theta slice looks like. That's a constant value of theta. Right? So there's a theta slice. And, uh, well, what is the range of values of uh, how many different thetas are there for which slices like this actually, in fact, slice through my solid? Well, here's what one of the slices looks like. And I appeal to your geometric intuition. What is What range of values of theta do I have to do to get the whole thing? Well, you've got to go all the way around. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. That is pretty familiar. Kind of, I mean, we had we saw something kind of analogous to that in polar coordinates. You know, if you want to get the whole disk going around, same thing. Okay. All right. Next question. Now, just like every other kind of integral we've done, uh, having found my theta bounds, I'm now going to fix a value of theta to find the subsequent 
uh, r bounds, r being the next integral, uh, I've got to re- focus my attention now just on my existing theta slice. Theta is chosen somewhere between 0 and 2 pi for that value of theta and only for that value of theta. What's the range of values of r? And uh, by the way, let me redraw. Uh, so here's what my theta slice actually looks like. Well, r slices on that theta slice. Well, okay, an r slice in general is a cylinder. An r slice on the theta slice is just how does that cylinder intersect with this um, uh, with this theta slice, and that's just going to be a little line segment like that. So there's an r slice. Where is my first r slice? Where is my last r slice? Well, the first one is over here where r is equal to zero. The last one is over here at that point, which by the way, that point is on my (coughs) ball of radius a, and so thus at that point, r is a. So my r bounds, zero to a. (coughs) Yeah, everybody happy with the picture? All right, so um, continuing along. Um, on my now r slice of my theta slice. Theta being fixed as well. Right. Uh, what's the range of values of my next variable, z? Well, okay, so fine. So z starts there. It's obviously zero. Right. Uh, where does z end? What's the ending value of z? Well, it's going to end at that point. Uh, what can I say about that point? And you got to keep in mind, you know, but bounds are determined by points. Points are on certain geometric objects like surfaces. Surfaces have certain equations. Solve for what you need in those equations, just like every other kind of integral we've ever done. And uh, that point, well, it's on that surface, which has that equation. I'll remind you that's the equation of a sphere and cylindrical coordinates. Uh, It's uh, something we talked about when we did cylindrical coordinates um, a couple days ago. Um, In that equation, keep in mind, I am looking for z. So I need to solve for z in that equation. Do have to actually do a little bit of algebra there. Solving for z in that equation, uh, you get uh, this there. Yep. Yeah, okay, so the R slice uh, is that. So specifically, that's the R slice of the theta slice that we drew, which is this whole thing. Yeah, right. Yep. Um, Even if it doesn't ask you to go from rectangular to polar, that you just start at polar coordinates to find the... uh, Cylindrical, but yeah. Cylindrical coordinates, um, you Uh still have to include the stretching factor, even if you're not doing change variables. Oh, I am doing change of variables. I mean, unavoidably, I'm doing a change. I mean, when I start writing down, when I say, uh, you know, I'm going to re- uh, compute this integral uh, like this, right? Uh, I mean, the, the the person who came to me was describing a ball of radius a in the x, y, z world. The question came to me in x, y, z world. And if I write this down, I'm saying, nah, I, I want to do an integral in r theta z world. So I, I am unavoidably doing a uh, a change of variables. Yeah. So if it already comes to you, then in the r theta world, you don't have to include the structure factor. So this is a dangerous question. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, if I mean, it, it, this would be a really weird circumstance if someone was like, okay, I don't I don't know what x, y, and z are. I just, I live in r theta z space. And in that space, I want to do something. Why would you? I mean, that's weird, right? Let me say it this way: If r is being interpreted as a distance from the origin, right? Then you're in X, Y, Z space, right? Um, it, it, the, the question as you describe it, uh, R would have to be interpreted as as an axis, right? Where constant values are, are planes. And if that's what a constant value of R looks like in your world, then yes, you are in R theta Z. That's not, the th- it's not a thing, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It technically, I suppose, you know, I guess it could happen, but it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, now let me show you a different way to do this. Uh, same question. Um, I chose my differentials in that order for um, eh, incomplete reasons. I didn't give you any justification of why. Um, and by the way, there are really only two reasonable ways to do it. 
to order your differentials. Uh, let me uh, try to get these both on the screen at the same time. Um, uh, in particular, you should always have your R inside of your theta. And I think it makes loads of sense, practically all cases, to have your R and theta differentials together. Right, so really the only question is, do you want your dr d theta inside of or outside of your dz? So those are your two options. Uh, we just did dz dr d theta. Now let's do dr d theta dz. Same domain, just slicing it differently. And let's see what that looks like. And I'm going to speed it up a little bit because uh, it's it's uh, now yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, Okay, so uh, what's the range of values of z? Well, z slices. Start there. All look kind of like that. They end there. Pretty easy to see that z starts at 0 and ends at, well, the North Pole, which is at A because it's a ball of radius A. Okay. All right, now, on a z slice, uh, next question. Uh, what's the range of values of theta? Well, theta... My theta slices are all going to look kind of like that. You know, I'm going to make a mess if I do it like that here. Let me do that. Let me switch to the pencil. Uh, yeah, so my theta slice, well, theta slices actually look like that, but a theta slice of my z slice. It's a little line segment, and in general, my theta slices will look like that, and I think it's a pretty easy cell that theta, again, 0 to 2 pi. And then finally, um, on uh, my theta slice of my z slice, uh, by the way, for ease of drawing, one thing you can do is take your z slice and just redraw your z slice. Look at its projection. We don't care about the z coordinates anymore. We already know our z bounds. Look at its projection in the xy plane. Redraw that projection. It's just a little bit easier to see what's going on. So again, like we said before, here's your theta slices, you know, all the way around 0 to 2 pi. <coughs> um, on a given theta slice then, that being a theta slice, uh, need to know now the range of values of R. Well, R starts there which is clearly where r equals 0, right? And r ends here at that point. Now, huh, I've got to think that through. Uh, what's the value of r there? Um, the value of r there, uh, well, you could think of it as that point is on this circle. That circle is this circle. So really, you're talking about a point that's on the original sphere, and you could just, on that original sphere, solve for r. Um, another thing you could do is you could instead say, well, given a z, I know the equation of the cross-section circle. It's that. Okay. So either way, um, you get the same result. That r is square root of a squared minus c squared. Okay. All right, so same big ideas. Uh, again, reminder, uh, your your DV, your, your ordering of your differentials is almost always, I'll say for the purposes of Math 212, it's always going to be one of these or the other. Right? The DRD theta is either inside of or outside of the DZ. Take your pick. But always put DR inside of D theta. Okay. All right. Okay, so spherical coordinates. This is definitely a little bit different. Um, uh, I made a big deal. Recall, you know, if I'm okay with the idea of thinking of cylindrical coordinates as being, you know, they're kind of polar coordinates in R3. And that's kind of fine, right? But spherical coordinates, no. That's a huge problem. If you think of, if you think of spherical coordinates, well, it's pretty much polar coordinates. Oh, no. It's very, very different. Okay. So, um, what does remain is that we are still looking at um, change of coordinates formulas as being now a change of variables function. Same way, you can compute the stretching factor. Uh, by the way, there are some, uh, there's a little bit of 
trigonometry, algebra, working out to be done there. You've got a three by three determinant that's full of partial derivatives, all of which are full of trig. So, I mean, it's, there's some work to be done, right, in com computing that determinant. Um, this is something I think everybody should do this once in their lives. I've done mine. Right? So I want to encourage you all to do that uh, on your own. I think it's a great exercise. Please take the time uh, to do that. And uh, But uh, here's a nice punchline. Um, that determinant is uh, rho squared sine phi. Now, here's where a lot of students make a mistake. Um, we Notice the absolute values. Notice we don't want to deal with absolute values. And then a lot of students think, oh, well, yeah, but come on, stroke coordinates. It's pretty much just polar coordinates. With polar coordinates, it was r that we had to worry about being positive. We had to promise that we will always choose r to be positive, and therefore I can ignore absolute values. Well, rho is kind of like the r. And so a lot of students think that their constraint at this point is that you must choose rho to be positive. Now look at the equation. That makes no sense at all, right? So what do you get out of promising to always choose rho to be positive if you're just going to square it? it doesn't make any difference at all. Choose rho to be negative if you feel like it. It's not going to matter as far as these absolute values are concerned. These absolute values are not at all concerned about the rho squared. They're concerned with that sine phi. That's what you need to ensure is not negative. Right? And the way you ensure sine phi is never negative is make a completely non-analogous promise right, uh, on your choices of spherical variables. Um, make sure that you promise that you will always choose phi to be between zero and pi. Right? That will make sine phi non-negative, and that makes the absolute values go away. Right? So anyway, heads up, right? That's my first, you know, sort of example of it's really not like polar coordinates. Okay, so um, good news, again, good news. That's what I was going to do anyway. Right? I mean, it, given the choice, y'all remember that exercise that I gave y'all uh, when we were talking about spherical coordinates last week? And uh, you get four different ways and different choices of phi's and thetas, and uh, it gets super confusing, right? Um, these are the values of phi that are mm, the easiest. So good news, just promise that you'll only do the easiest ones, <laughs> right? And as a result, you also get another bit of good news, which I get uh, I get to ignore the absolute values. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, just like in polar coordinates, the, your, you know, and cylindrical coordinates, and the analogy is true here, in the same way that I don't have to draw the pullback domain, um, I can just look at what cross-sections look like in the existing XYZ world. Well, same deal here. I don't have to pull, I don't have to draw the pullback domain. Um, you can just see what these slices look like in XYZ world. So, for example, let's look at, uh, you know, rho equals a constant, namely a slice in the pullback domain, uh, you know, a D rho slice. Constant value of rho in XYZ world. That's what that slice is going to look like. It's kind of a sphere. Right. Likewise, uh, what does a uh, phi slice look like? A constant value of phi? Well, a constant value of phi is a uh, cone. Right? So it's just a matter of looking through and just you know, observing what these things look like. And by the way, likewise, a uh, constant value of theta. Um, theta really is a lot like it was in cylindrical coordinates. It's the same theta. That's true. And so you get that kind of a slice. So um, you're uh, slicing up your domain with some really weird looking knives. <laughs> right? you can try to I've never seen a knife that would make a cut like that. That'd be impressive. Don't know how to do that. Uh, more relevantly, I don't really uh, like the prospect of having to draw a picture where I take some three-dimensional shape and make a spherical slice of it. I, that's going to be really hard to draw. Right? Okay, so uh, good news. We can make a preference. We can make a choice here to uh, keep our lives as simple as possible. Of these three different choices of slices, I very clearly like that one best. So I'm going to say let's always do d theta on the outside, always. And again, there are precious few counterexamples that are highly manufactured, and we don't need to worry about them. So in this course, always 
do D theta on the outside for crying out loud. Uh, it's hands down uh, best choice. Now at this point, uh, your uh, your options for second slice are well, you can either go with uh, a conical slice inside of that plane, which by the way, of course, would just be a line segment. Or you can go with a spherical slice inside of that plane, which by the way, of course, would look like um, a uh, circle. So what's your preference between these? Do you like uh, straight lines or do you like curves? I like straight lines. Right? It's easier to visualize. And so, again, strong preference. Do your D-phi slicing second. And then, for your row values, just look, you know, on your, uh, whatever your solid is, on your phi slice of your theta slice, look for the starting value of row, look for the ending value of row, and those will determine your row bounds. So, um, it's always in the same order. It's very convenient, yeah. Don't we solve, though, these integrals from inside out? Yeah, that's a weird thing, and th that's right. So we, we slice from outside in, but we you're quite right. We evaluate from inside out, okay. and it is it is uh, backwards. That's the awkwardness of the language. That's why I talk about inside integrals and outside integrals instead of first and second. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, again, um, super easy to oops and forget the stretching factor. Can't tell you how often I see this. I make a big deal out of it every year, and uh, it always it continues to happen. And what? And it's uh, I get it. I mean, I, it's understandable what happens is students are drawing pictures and trying to think about what these slices look like, spending a lot of time thinking about these bounds, and uh, whoops, forget inadvert. I mean, I was look at my pictures; they're so good. Look at my my bounds are all right, but you forgot the stretching factor, and this is a tremendously important part of doing an integral in spherical coordinates. If you don't put the stretching factor in there, it's wildly wrong. And, and uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, the naive, I mean, it's really critically at a, a fundamental level a very, a very big mistake. So my solution to that, um, as uh, with the other things, is think of this as a single thing. Write it down all at once. Rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. All one thing. It's one breath, one you know stroke of the pen. Let's write the whole thing down all at once so that you don't forget it. And again, it's surprisingly easy otherwise to forget that. Okay. All right. By the way, also, make sure to memorize that little formula, uh, rho squared sine phi. Um, and another thing that happens more often than it should is that students will write down uh, like rho sine squared phi. Oh, no, it's, you know, just, I mean, take the 30 seconds, right, and make sure to memorize with 100% confidence rho squared sine phi. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, it's, it, everything's analogous. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of examples here just because I think it's good to see, you know, uh, uh, what does it look like? What's the... What does it feel like? What does it smell like? Right, you got to get your hands in there and really do some uh, to to get good at it. Uh, but it is pretty analogous to the other kinds of coordinate system integrals that we've done to this point. Um, I will make a pitch here. Take your drawings seriously. The drawings are a huge assistance, if nothing else, to you as you're trying to look through and see what this thing looks like. And if you're trying to operate with a bad picture, then you're just making your own life difficult, and that's bad. The other thing is you got to keep in mind, points are awarded based on what we can reasonably, confidently infer that you understood in the statement, in, in the uh, solving of the problem. And if you have a good picture, then I can see, I can see, oh, I can see that you understood the picture, and I can see that your slicing was reasonable, etc. You know, things like that. Um, if I can't interpret from your picture, I can't give you credit. <laughs> I can't give you credit for understanding something if I can't understand what you're telling me about it. So I, anyway, along those lines, it's very much in your interest in multiple ways to make good drawings. So please take that seriously. Uh, reminder, YouTube channel, uh, miscellaneous topics, playlist, couple of, couple of um, recordings there about how to make good, decent drawings. Okay, all right, so here's our question. First question. Suppose we're looking at this ball of radius A centered at 
uh, a on the z-axis, right? So the the center is uh, you know uh, whoops, center is uh, up here, not at the origin. Uh, that's our domain. Uh, let's start slicing it up. Uh, theta slices first. Theta slices look like this. I appeal to your geometry, your 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 ability to visualize the picture. Uh, the slices in this case have to go all the way around. So zero to two pi. That's straight from the picture. Um, okay, now you could, as we've done before, you could take your theta slice, see what that looks like, and you could then start doing uh, phi slices of that theta slice, and you know these are what they look like. And the problem is, you find yourself looking at this nice flat plane, but you're not looking at the flat plane straight on. You're looking at kind of a weird angle. And it's just a little harder to see angles inside of a plane that you're looking at from an angle. It's just a little, uh, it's a little awkward, right? So my advice, I think this is good advice, take an extra moment. Once you've got your theta slice, uh, identified. Hey, let me go back uh, over here. Uh, let's do this in green. Uh, you've got your th a, a theta slice drawn. You might even draw the slice itself. Go ahead and redraw that picture. <coughs> right, and here's what that picture looks like looking at it straight on. In other words, uh, looking at it kind of, if you will, from over there like that. You're looking straight on at it. And it's just easier to see What's going on with that slice? If you're looking at it straight on, it's for your consideration, right? It's not required, but I think it's really handy. Um, so, for example, uh, that theta slice. Now, I know that that theta slice looks like this. And uh, now, thinking about phi slices. Well, phi slices in this angled. Uh, you know, looking at the picture sort of at an angle. These are what my phi slices look like. And you can see we start at zero and we end. In other words, my last, my last one where I don't just completely miss is at uh, pi over two. All right, so zero to the horizontal, which is phi equals pi over two. Okay. All right. Um, heads up. Um, landmine. A lot of students make the mistake, uh, just maybe a little too comfortable with things having always been conveniently set up in the past and measure phi incorrectly. I, it, there's no rational basis for this, but a lot of students are, comf are just kind of tend to think of, well, we measure angles from the center of whatever it is that I'm looking at. And that's just not the same, right? Phi is not defined as the angle off of the z-axis measured from whatever point you choose, right? It's always measured at the origin, right? So so uh, that kind of wishful thinking can uh, get you into big trouble. You get the wrong answer here, yeah. Why are the values in this order? Don't angles generally tend to go counterclockwise? Well, no, so the angle is measured inside of the uh, inside of your theta slice. Right? If you look back at the definition of spherical coordinates, it's inside of the theta slice uh, and uh, measured off of the z-axis from the origin. So if you're trying to measure, you know, what what is the value of phi at that point, for example, phi is that angle. And yeah, right. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that, I kind of made that up. I mean, uh, let me. Let, it's a good gripe. Thank you for that. Let me um, let me talk about that for a moment. Here's my theta slice. Uh, here's my looking at the theta slice uh, straight on for my own visual convenience. Uh, up here, I can see that there is an there's a z axis, and looking at it, you know, this other way, that's what it ha looks like, right? Then the question comes up, well, what is this thing? I kind of want to give it a name. Well, back in the real world, it's that. And yeah, I'm calling it an R-axis because it's this is a direction in which 
R is increasing, right? It's it's not there isn't really an R axis, right? But uh, I just wanted to give it a name down here, just to, uh, so you could help to help you kind of tie you to uh, what does how does this theta slice live inside of you know the real world okay. up here? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Okay, okay. Last question uh, on this uh, integral is uh, what is the range of values of rho? Now, again. We've got our theta slice. Inside of our theta slice, we have our phi slice of our theta slice. And on that phi slice of that theta slice, I want to know the range of values of rho. Well, rho starts there, <coughs> which is clearly zero. Right? And it ends there. Now, you've got to be careful with that point where it ends. Keep in mind, I redrew this picture for kind of convenience, but don't forget where it came from. That's really a point over here. It's a point that is on that sphere. And I can write down the equation of that sphere. The equation of that sphere uh, is... Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, X squared plus Y squared plus uh, Z minus A squared equals a squared, and I need to solve for rho in that equation. And here we have an example, another example of how you might need to convert an equation from one coordinate system to the other. I need to solve for rho. Rho is not in how this is written. So convert into spherical coordinates, and if you do, by the way, uh, this equation of the sphere turns into that. So make sure that you can do this derivation you can take the rectangular equation for the sphere and turn that into the spherical equation for the sphere. Solving for rho conveniently, that was kind of happened naturally anyway. And uh, that, therefore, is my upper rho bound. All right. A couple more examples I want to show you. Um, what if you have a sphere that's offset in a different way? Uh, so here our sphere is um, offset in kind of the y direction, if you will. So it's sitting over here like uh, like that, uh, centered at a on the y axis. And you know, draw the picture, start slicing it up, see what they look like. Um, a theta slice. Now this is you know getting to be artistically non-trivial, right? Um, but um, um, I appeal to your geometric intuition. That slice looks uh, kind of like that. Right, there's that slice inside of... Uh, let's see if I can do a better job of... It's a slice kind of cut through in the inside of that solid ball. And I appeal to your geometric intuition. Uh, the first such slice is over there where theta is equal to zero and these slices kind of go around over to there where my last such slice is theta equals to pi so there's my uh, there's my theta bounds and again you gotta see it from the picture um, I, I acknowledge there's a lot of challenge in the, the geometric aspects of this. And I, I, I think it's a mistake to try to uh, avoid the geometry and uh, try to, oh, I'm going to look for algebraic alternatives. <laughs> it's really hard. And it very often just doesn't work. Um, uh, I refer you to some old examples that we saw when we were seeing triple integrals in rectangular coordinates. Some of those with the, you know, where we had the planes intersecting in various ways and just got to draw the picture. Um, if you would like a visual aid, uh, one thing you can do, uh, uh, this is a reasonable option, um, you could uh, get some Play-Doh, right, and make yourself a ball as necessary, right, and then hold it off to the side and realize, okay, well, here's my ball, and, you know, this point over here is the origin, and let me just see what slices through that Play-Doh look like, and just literally cut through it with a little butter knife, whatever, right, and um, you'll have a visual model and you can and see perhaps a little bit more directly. Alternatively, if you don't have any Play-Doh, sack of oranges works pretty well, right? Then you can eat the oranges. We should all be eating more fruit anyway, right? So um, give yourself a visual aid if you'd like. Now, obviously, you can't bring a sack of oranges into the exam, 
right? <laughs> you certainly can't bring a knife into the exam. All right, <laughs> let me make that perfectly clear. Um, but uh, at, while you're doing the homework, you know, you've got a lot of options. Um, so uh, capitalize. Okay, um, our theta slice. Again, I'm going to redraw just for visual convenience. You know, uh, z axis. Uh, and again, forgive me. You know, r axis as if. Um, and uh, on that, then slice uh, our so our theta slice looks like uh, this. On that theta slice, we ask what's the range of values of the next variable. Next variable being uh, phi. Well, this is what a phi slice looks like, and uh, they kind of start up here like this, measuring off the origin, mind you. So they start with phi equals zero, and they end with phi equals pi. Just got to see it from the picture. Okay, and then on a phi slice of our theta slice, uh, what's the deal with rho? Well, rho starts there. That's clearly the origin. That's clearly where rho equals zero. No problem. Uh, next, uh, the upper bound. The upper bound for rho. Well, it's going to be determined by that point. Don't forget that point is actually that point right there. It's on the surface of the sphere. It's on that equation. And again. You've got to go through and you've got to solve. Turn that into an equation, not an inequality to get the boundary surface. You're going to have to solve for rho. You're going to have to convert that, you know, written as an equation into spherical coordinates. And what you end up with, and again, there's a process here. Make sure you can do it. Right? And you, in this case, get uh, rho equals 2 sine phi sine theta. And so, again, uh, as, we, as we wrote, um, Slicing up, a little bit of algebra, and there's our bounds. Notice I didn't forget my stretching factor. See how you could forget that? Right? There's so much attention that has to go into figuring out these bounds. Oh, it's so easy to ah, just uh, forget that one little thing. Yeah? Um, if the um, ball was centered around the origin, wouldn't your v go from 0 to 2 pi? No, you'd be double counting. So you got to keep in mind that when we're looking at at phi, we're looking on a theta slice. If theta is going to go all the way around from zero to two pi, mm -hmm. then um, a value of, of a point that's over here that you'd be thinking of as going as phi going around sort of all the way, right? You will get to all of these points for a different value of theta, okay. right? So yeah, so I, so you should you should always think of Theta, I think it's just easier, right, to think of theta as going all the way around and make phi stop. And also, don't forget, things get a little weird. You're going to have absolute values pop up if you ever let phi go outside of the zero to pi range. Yeah. Right. Okay. Last example I want to show you all. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's look at the region that's satisfies these two inequalities. Uh, this is tough, right? It's really hard to draw. Um, let me draw these regions one at a time, uh, starting with uh, that, the set of points that are, I think I can appeal to your geometric intuition. These are points that are outside of the unit ball. <coughs> so it's, um, you know, outside of the unit ball. And likewise, this says we're looking at points that are inside of this other ball, same size, but offset by one. So we're looking at points that are inside the green ball, but outside the yellow ball. And you just got to look, you know, okay, well, inside there, but outside there. Just you know, kind of think it through, and uh, not hard to persuade yourself that altogether uh, what we're talking about is this kind of thing here. That's weird. Yeah, everybody good? So that's our R. Okay, and I've drawn a poor picture of it here. I'm going to say poor, but let me explain why, among other reasons why this is poor. Um, I drew it as if this thing has a corner right there, but it doesn't. It's not a corner. Uh, where these two spheres intersect is actually a circle there's actually a whole circular edge 
in where those spheres intersect. And this thing that I'm trying to describe, actually, you know, it sort of goes down to... It sort of, you know, all the way down to there, if you will. So it actually goes... You don't have a corner, you have a, a, a lip, if you will, right, around the bottom. So now I would draw it like that, except the problem is, is then it, it's hard to reveal the fact that, yeah, but there is, in fact, this indentation where this bottom sphere is kind of pushing up into it, right? So it's just a hard thing to draw. Three-dimensional solids, they're hard to draw. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, first appeal that I will make is that if you're looking at your uh, theta slice, uh, well, it's it's pretty clear, I think, that this thing, in fact, does... Uh, it kind of surrounds the z-axis, you might say. And so theta, I think it's pretty satisfying. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Yeah, okay. Um, now, let's draw that theta slice. Here's where it's going to be particularly important to draw that theta slice over. Um, we've got this hard to draw solid. It's hard to visualize what the solid looks like. Trying to see in this hard picture what the slice looks like, it's just tough. And it's so easy if instead, if you just observe that, well, look, in this theta slice, my original sphere... This sphere in that slice, it, well, it's just uh, it's just a semicircle, and uh, this sphere in that slice is just um, that. And so, if I'm looking for this part that's in between them, if I'm looking for you know what's inside of there, its slice, pretty easy appeal. It's just what's inside of there. I think that's a pretty believable, pretty believable observation. What do y'all think about that? Is that satisfying? It, weirdly, by the way, we've drawn a slice. <laughs> it's easier to draw the slice of this awkward solid than it is to draw the s solid itself. Eh, for your consideration. Um, okay, so on that. Uh, region. Uh, let's see. So we've already got our theta bounds figured out. So our phi bounds now. Um, phi slices. Keep in mind. Oh, whoa! That was my elbow. Um, phi starts there. Here's what phi s slices look like. Phi ends there. Uh, pretty easy pitch. That first phi slice is phi equals zero. Um, the last phi slice, uh, we're going to get to that by uh, a clever <coughs> argument that's not unlike something we've done before. I claim that we have a uh, equilateral triangle in play. Um, namely, our equilateral triangle is, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm going to draw it like that. Equilateral because that is a radius of one of the circles. Uh, which is a unit circle. That is a radius of that same circle, namely that circle. Those are both radii. Therefore, those distances are one. And this is a radius of that other circle. And so, again, all those distances are one. Therefore, it's equilateral. Therefore, this angle that I'm looking for uh, is... Um, that angle there, that ending value of phi is uh, pi over 3. Okay, so uh, a neat thing to always be on the lookout for, the possibility that sometimes you don't have to do loads of algebra to find something. You can just outsmart it. That's nice. Okay. Okay, lastly, um, on a given phi slice, right, there's a phi slice. We pick an arbitrary value of phi. Uh, rho starts at that point. That point is on that curve. That curve, don't forget, came from actually that circle on which rho is pretty easy to figure out. Rho is just one on that circle. It's a unit circle. Unit disk. Sorry, no, unit sphere. Sorry. Um, right, so uh, the ending value of phi, excuse me, ending value of rho, that point, which is on that circle, which came from this sphere, where you're going to have to do some work. 
right? You get to write down the equation of that sphere solved for rho, and you get that. Okay. Everybody on board? Questions? Okay. All right. So uh, uh, don't forget the rho squared sine phi. Again, you write that down immediately. As soon as you write down the differentials, in fact, as you write, before you're writing down the differentials, right, this one single thing, rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta, right, all at once, and then you won't forget. Okay. Okay, so that's spherical coordinates. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I need to get started on the next topic, which is um, uh, we're going to start with scalar surface integrals. Uh, the book uh, t describes this as a discussion of surface area, and that's a special case. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the more general thing. The book gets around to doing the more general thing later. I feel like we might as well do it now. Um, the uh, starting point of the conversation is to consider um, that what if I'm trying to compute a mass, or what if I'm counting population of something, or what if I'm adding up in so something else for whatever reason, right? Any sort of a chop it up, add it up kind of scenario, and I'm just not using a domain of the sort that we've previously considered. What if I'm doing uh, trying to compute the mass of a bent rod that's bent around in in uh, in the xy plane like that? This isn't a single variable integral. It's not an interval on the x-axis. That's not a calc one problem. I can't use a single variable integral to deal with that. There's a temptation then to say, okay, well, double integral. No, it's not a double integral because this does not break up into little pieces of area. It breaks up into little pieces of length. It's just, it's not really two-dimensional. It's not really one-dimensional. It's just different. So it's a hard problem until you just realize, no, it's just a different kind of Riemann sum. So let's not try to cram this into a the double integral package that we've already got created. It's just not that kind of thing. We're just going to have to define a new kind of Riemann sum and figure out how to compute them. And likewise, if I have a curve that's in space, or weirdly, if I have a surface in space, it's uh, kind of three-dimensional, uh, except it's not made up of volume, so it's not a triple integral. It's not a it's not a double integral. It's in three dimensions for crying out loud, right? So it's just another kind of a Riemann sum. So um, it's actually pretty easy to deal with these. You just again define a new Riemann sum. If you have a curve and you chop it up, add it up, there's what a reasonable Riemann sum would look like. Notice you have little pieces of length. Now, computing those little pieces of length is a, okay, we're going to have to deal with that, right? But nevertheless, it's got some little piece of length. Let me just call it delta S. And I can talk about adding it up, like so. No big deal. And a uh, very reasonable notation, of course, would be this. Reasonable in the sense that, well, we make our differentials shorthands like that and uh, we're adding up um, over a one dimensional domain I mean the curve itself it's just little pieces of there's one index there right it's a summation over just I going from one to N as we slice that up so single integral the notation is pretty plausible uh, likewise on a piece of surface we have little pieces of area and our differential we would write ds not that surprising, really. Okay. Um, so uh, the thought I want to leave you all with is the question of how, having defined these things, these brand new kinds of Riemann sums, chop it up, add it up, right? We could think about, exam maybe I'm counting ants on that, crawling on that wire, or maybe I'm computing the mass of a bent sheet of metal, or maybe I'm trying to figure out how many weeds are growing on that hill, what have you, right? How do you actually compute these things? Um, and the, the big idea that I want to uh, plant thought in your mind, you know, to be chewing on this until um, until Wednesday, what we have here is a domain that we don't like. The domain is what I like to call dimensionally awkward. <laughs> right? It's a, it's a one-dimensional domain in a two-dimensional world or a two-dimensional domain in a three-dimensional world. It's just sort of weird. Um, and what do we do? When we don't like a domain, um, change of variables. 
we view it as an image and we do the pullback stretching factor strategy. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're literally going to view this as a summation over a domain I don't like. I'm going to make it an image and do a pullback. There's a couple of details we have to work out. How do you compute your stretching factor? That's a detail we'll talk about next time. And then um, we just do the pullback integral. All right, see you all later. Have a good one.